I'd like to welcome you to an event uh, session of the Center for Palestine Studies. The center itself is five years old uh, and remains the only such center in the Western Hemisphere. I'm the co-director, Brinkley Messick. I'm a professor of anthropology. And I'd like to welcome you specifically to the launch of the second part of a new project called Palestine Cuts. It figures among the art initiatives of the Center for Palestine Studies. And it's conceived as a new space for filmmakers and video artists to present and discuss their work in an engaging and encouraging environment. It's a new space, in short, at Columbia University and in New York City for the filmic arts of Palestine. This is, the, again, the second stage uh, of this inaugural event in which we envision uh, as a series, as an ongoing conversation to be continued and developed in the coming academic years a conversation between visiting artists and local faculty, students, and fi the film and video community. In other words, in short, a community and a conversation. And before I introduce our guest filmmaker, I just want to mention the names of a few people who have made this project possible. Um, uh, and some of them were in attendance last night, and some others are in attendance tonight, today, this afternoon. The, but the people who lent their names to this project at, at the very beginning, Hamid Dabashi and James Seamus, were crucial to lifting its prospects from the outset. Uh, then also, we've had uh, continuing conversations with a number of faculty, uh, and, uh, people like Richard Pena, uh, Madeline Doby, Brian Larkin, uh, Keith Sanborn, and Francis Negron Montagna, who is actually here tonight today, as opposed to those who were there last night. Also, anthropology graduate student uh, Hadil Asali was crucial to the early discussions. She's a video maker in her own right, has worked in Gaza. And postdoctoral scholar Omar Jabari Salamanca, who was crucial to the early ideas of this project and who ended up designing our logo. And he will figure uh, this afternoon as a, a facilitator, a convener of our discussions. Um, also, to, uh, I want to thank Dalia Zain, our, our wonderful, skilled Center for Palestine Studies program director, who is the, responsible for all this organization that makes these things possible. And to our friends, uh, um, the, the, the Levy Churches, uh, without whose support, uh, the ambitions here would be much more limited. Um, and so I'd like to now just to welcome the filmmaker and producer, Mohanad Yakubi, who joins us from Ramallah, Palestine. Mohanad teaches film studies at the International Art Academy in Palestine. He is part of Subversive Films, a curatorial and research collective that focuses on militant film practices. Yakubi is a producer of internationally screened films such as Infiltrators by Khaled Jorar, Pink Bullet by Ramzi Hasboun, and he is the co-producer of Habibi by Suzanne Youssef, and Though I Know the River is Dry by Omar R. Hamilton. He's also the creator and producer of the project Suspended Time, an anthology film by nine filmmakers reflecting on 20 years after the signing of the Oslo Peace Accords. His latest short, No Exit, written in collaboration with Omar Khayri, had its premiere at the Dubai International Film Festival. Last night, we had a workshop in which uh, he screened for us in a special screening. This is a film that hasn't been released yet, screened in a fine cut version. This is Off Frame, A Journey Through Militant Cinema. It's a film about, and not to summarize it, but about the Palestine, Palestinian film unit, the PFU. In the workshop, we had both the screening and then a discussion moderated by Hamid Dabashi, a professor at the university. This afternoon, we have a master class on Palestinian militant cinema. And uh, myself, I have never attended a master class, so I am unable to even conceive of what, what's, what's involved. And, and you too. <laughs> well, then we're all a little virginal in this topic, but how nice, experimental, yes. But this is going to be, um, as we, um, I, won't, I won't try to characterize what it's going to be, actually. And maybe we'll turn it over to, um, to Mohanad for a presentation, and after that, we will engage with him in a discussion, and Omar will facilitate that discussion, Omar Salamanca. Thank you, welcome. Um, 
Thanks a lot. Uh, and I would like to thank, um, uh, again, the Center of Palestine Study to offer this opportunity, and um, which is great. Like, usually, as a filmmaker, uh, it's very hard to have uh, reviews and feedbacks on your film before it's released. So you mainly get it from feedbacks and when it's released, and uh, you get the feedback when the film is released. And yeah, this is kind of a weird, like my, my colleague filmmakers would be like, why are you doing this? Like you should be uh, going to a film festival directly. But it's very important because the topic is, uh, the topic of the film itself I'm working on, it's very much dealing with the collective uh, memory of the Palestinians or the people that I come from. Um, of course, I would like to thank as well uh, uh, Omar, Omar Jabari Salamanca, who uh, very much was supportive, and not only for this event, but for a long time. The, the process has been six years now, and um, it's been going on, it seems like another, t another year. So you have to survive with me. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, my name is uh, Mohanad Yaqoubi. And I'm a filmmaker. Uh, I st actually, I'm a mechanical engineer. I graduated uh, as a mechanical engineer from Birzeit University in uh, Ramallah. <coughs> but I didn't go to my graduation because I was doing my first film. And um, yeah, I, it was like I stayed five years after graduation working on films and uh, learning uh, film techniques from the street. I, we don't have a proper film education in, uh, in Palestine or Ramallah. So what I learned from was like carrying tripods and following filmmakers and other cameramen and seeing all of this complexity of how to understand what is a Palestinian uh, image or how do we represent ourselves. And it was funny, there was one incident. I mean, I saw several uh, DPs, like the DP of Anne-Marie Jasser, Salt of the Sea, and then after that, the DP of uh, Pomegranate Samer, uh, of uh, what's her, her name, Najwa Najjar. And they all have this thing of having the camera being held not putting in a tripod. And it's like, I, and I ask them, ask both of them, why do you do that? And they say that's to reflect the situation. It's kind of an unstable situation, which is, uh, it has to be shaky to feel the emergency of the image. There is a fast, uh, fast movement all the time, which is kind of, I was all the time in my work, I try to at least put the camera on tripod when I'm, I'm, I'm filming, just to, to kind of uh, be against the norm. But that's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> That's part of it. But then it took me again like, to, to think about so how, how, where other representations, like how do we deal with the aesthetics of dealing with cameras, uh, dealing with the image itself, and how do we produce image? Is that related to the way we are thinking? And that comes really from that practice or that practice working on film. It comes to that I come and do a, a, a feature film MA in Goldsmith in 2008. It was a great opportunity to be there, but to be discovering a lot of what is happening, especially in the film history. But the striking moment for me was when I discovered that the Palestinian, that, that, that there is something for the Palestinian film industry, film, uh, film scene, that is related to the international. And that happened in a workshop, like a seminar, where we were talking about uh, third cinema. It was a big, big class, like 200 uh, students were there, and uh, Rachel Moore, who's like um, a, a totter, a teacher in militant cinema, third cinema practices, archival practices. She looked at me at that class and she told me, you're a Palestinian, right? Like, yes, I'm a Palestinian. So do you know Mustafa Abu Ali? Uh, I told her, I know, this, I know Mustafa Abu Ali. He's like an old director who uh, stays in Ramallah, but I never had the chance to see his films. She started to speak about Mustafa Abu Ali and his relation with Godard and then started to speak about Leipzig Film Festival as a being a, a central event for militant third world uh, struggle film practices that was meeting in Leipzig Film Festival. It's a film festival that was in uh, East Europe at that time, uh, in, in Berlin. Uh, no, Leipzig, sorry. And, uh, no, but the headquarters was in Berlin, so they were uh, making it in, uh, in, in Leipzig. And then there's another event uh, that was happening, and there was like several texts going out from there. And, and she was saying like, how, the Palestinian, how the Palestinian cause uh, uh, attracted many of the international filmmakers, especially coming after uh, many practices like being in Vietnam. Filmmakers were sol in solidarity with Vietnam, for example. There's a famous film made by a French collective, it's called uh, Far From Vietnam, was produced in 60, uh, 66, 67, 
And uh, yeah, all, uh, you can imagine everybody was there. Agnes Verda, Godard, Chris Marker, and uh, probably I can't remember the other names. But th th there was like a kind of certain practices of filmmaking and going, doing filmmaking that is more uh, uh, closer to the people rather than being uh, like being a reflection of an institution. And it's, it's a classic uh, discussion, like especially that's why we're a new, the new realism and the uh, novel vague cinema came uh, as, a, as a reflection or a kind of a presentation or um, trying to express different ways of making films. So when the Palestinian revolution comes in 68, it was kind of this ideas of making struggle cinema was almost, almost there. But what happens with the Palestinian cinema, revolution cinema, it comes and they made uh, better practices, let's say. They refined uh, the language and the statics of that. But I, 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 this is what the thing that I'm going to be speaking about, how the, the refined statics through the, from the period of 68 till uh, 82 in militant cinema. And that's, that's for me was fascinating to see that now we're, we're talking about film history. We're not talking about only, we have something in the film history as, as a Palestinian and as a, as a revolution. Because we intersect with many film practices like the landscape cinema in Japan, like in, uh, with Santiago Alvarez and the Cuban film uh, school that was happening. There were many people who were coming to, to Beirut especially and practicing filmmaking there. Um, and which and somehow created, a, a, a going more into the research, uh, I started to see that there is kind of a, an underground network uh, happening uh, between all of them, uh, between all of these filmmakers, like, yeah, you can go get, uh, some would take a camera from the French TV without the, the head of the TV knowing. They will take it to Palestine. Then maybe the Italian uh, Communist Party will pay for doing the negatives. And then maybe they can do it in Beirut after that to do the final screening. Distribution will be the responsibility of the PLO. They will make, like, pay for 60, 70 copies and uh, throw them out there. But uh, when I started, like after that class, I went out uh, from the class and it was very mixed feeling. Like, uh, why did I, and I grew up in, um, I didn't grow up within a, 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 the revolutionary milieu, let's say, and my parents were not involved in, in this at all. But and somehow it felt to me like this, there's something resonating. Uh, from the way I'm seeing myself first and the way I'm seeing the things around me that is related to, to the way there. And uh, starting to research and finding documents and finding papers, it was not an easy thing, especially many things were written in French. I mean, the main source of uh, the experience about that was for coming from the Courrier de Cinema, which is a French uh, like notebook or a magazine about cinema that was mainly producing after 68, in May 68 by uh, several groups, um, including Godard. And um, so I, I came, I, came uh, I found this uh, very strange text by Mustafa Abu Ali. Uh, it's kind of his diary. Uh, I, I'll, read, uh, I'll read a bit of it, and then um, we'll see something. Um, he writes, it's, uh, it's mid-1976 now. The airport is closed. We have 15,000 meters of both color negatives and uh, reversal films. There is nowhere in Beirut where we could develop and print these films. Some of these films have been locked up in uh, canisters for three months now. Since they were shot, they will definitely be destroyed if they will not develop in faster, fastest time possible. And uh, in 1976, while the civil war was uh, raging, that's, uh, I'm reflecting on that. In 1976, while the civil war was raging across Lebanon, a group of Palestinian and Arab militant filmmakers who formed what was called the Palestine Cinema Institute, have been or, uh, agonizing for a month over what to do with thousands of meters of unexposed films they shot during the events of the Civil War with the focus on Tel Zatar massacre. With the intention to make a film, they were uh, desperately searching for means to keep the celluloid material from disintegrating uh, and, a place to find, and, a, and a place to finance and develop the negatives. Uh, finally, they were put in touch with the Italian Communist Party, uh, the ICP. The ICP agreed to co-produce the film and offer its developing labs run by Unitele Films in Rome. However, one question remains, how to get the 15,000 meter uh, of film packed in large cans out of Lebanon to Italy? That was actually, when we were work, working on film, like uh, I wanted to have something to follow, a journey. It's not only, because it's very hard to transfer a research into, uh, into kind of a text, unless I'm doing an essay film. 
but uh, I don't know, I come from more like a classical background, I still need to have a story and three act and uh, <laughs> there is like kind of a climax and things happening. So I decided to take this one, there's a, there is a question, the 15,000 meters of negatives that needs to be going out. Uh, but it's not only that simple, thinking about it like, okay, thinking about the dimension of 15,000 meters, that was like uh, around three meters, like three meters, maybe two meters half high, uh, that uh, it was like almost a meter and a half, and it's more about 500 canisters. It's kind of a big operation to do that. And I started to think, so how does that happen? It doesn't, like, nothing happens just like suddenly. There should be a, a background, there should be an experience of, of doing that. And then uh, continue with his uh, diary of Mustafa until he reached to um, one point talking about that uh, when he were in the, they, they went, they took the negatives, they managed to take it. It's not only him because there was a, a work of the institute and he was the head of the institute. And so there was like uh, other filmmaker like Nabiha Lutfi. Uh, she's a Lebanese Egyptian filmmaker. She was also filming with that. There was Jean Shamoun, he's a Lebanese director who was uh, the, from the Lebanese Communist Party. So they were thinking about how can we take it out and they took it to Saida. Saida where it has the kind of the, air, the port for the Palestinian, they build it up after the 75, and uh, Mustafa uh, put them, put, put these negatives in a small ship that was going to Cyprus, and from there they were, should be transported to uh, Beirut, to Rome. Uh, he writes, uh, while in the ship, the, like an Israeli uh, Navy uh, ship came close to them and was like stopped the whole, the small ship of Mustafa Abu Ali, they had to hide down uh, beside the negatives, and he writes about that moment, like thinking about uh, that they still have to run away and they still have to hide, even uh, that they went through all of the fights. And he mentioned the work of 1970 uh, in, in Amman and the experience of that. It's like this, this, there was a, a moment of humiliation in him. So that's the moment where I decided, okay, there is, it's not the film, it's not about the research, it's not about that journey. It's about what they were doing in, in Amman. Because if I understand what's happening, what happened in Amman and where the, they got their aesthetics and their inspiration, and somehow I will understand that moment in, in 1976. So I did, uh, I did one trailer of uh, trying, I mean, I'm trying to explain now this. I did a trailer trying to say this story first. أخيرا بعد 24 ساعة وصلنا إلى قبرص انتظرت أسبوعا حتى حصلت على مقعد على طائرة متجهة إلى روما في المطار تحجز الأفلام ويمضي أسبوع على احتجازها وأنا كمن نجلس على النار الأفلام ستتلف إذا لم تحمل So one of the one of the students who, who was here at the time that I was here was uh, was a Palestinian called Mustafa Abu Ali, who went back to work and, and was running the uh, film the the the, the Palestinians uh, film the, the propaganda department for for Fatah and people like that. And it was in in Jordan. We were in the first stage, or at least we were in the first stage of the Palestinian film, which was the first stage of the Palestinian film. 
كنا واعيين أن احنا يجب أن نبحث عن لغة سينمائية خاصة فينا يمكن تلخيصها بأنه سينما الشعب من أجل الشعب The Palestinian struggle is just a part of the general struggle all over the world against imperialism. It's related to Vietnam, it's related to Laos, to Cuba, to South America, everywhere, and we have to present it that way. كانوا يصوروا العمليات اللي بتدخل عبر النهر، وكانوا مرات يصوروا المقاتلين قبل ما يروحوا على العملية، وبعدين لما إذا استشهدوا كل الحدث. خديجة انترفيو شوت خمسة تيك واحد فاهم So it's the whole thing I mean uh, I did this this uh, this trailer and uh, I was lucky enough to get some uh, funding to start the, the actual research and the actual research for me was like okay so what is the the moment now they, they we have I, I can't imagine myself be I was trying to put myself in uh, in their shoes and imagining if I graduated now from film school in London and I go back to Ramallah and uh, the the or like or to 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 Amman and the revolution or there is a kind of a political movement happening happening there what would I be doing I mean if I didn't if I graduated from uh, I don't know NYU for example would I be equipped enough to be thinking about how can I be politically involved? Is that enough to be studying uh, film techniques to be able to make a, a revolutionary <coughs> film? Or like to be more doing a more committed and political, politically committed film? And that's where I started to think about the education. Uh, what, the, what type of education these uh, guys got? Especially it was, the beginning was, uh, there was three people who established the Palestine Film Unit. One of them is Mustafa Abu Ali, and there is Hani Johariya and Sulafa Jadallah. Two of them, Mustafa and Hani, they studied in the London Film School, uh, which co was called, I think, London School of Film Technique at that time. It was one of the two main, main schools that uh, was teaching film in, uh, in London. And I had to go there and to check what they were studying. And uh, actually, there is a lot of elements coming from uh, studying in, uh, in the London Film School, especially that the technique they're not based on teaching you how to become a cameraman. They based the whole thing, the whole schedule, curriculum of them, that they have three years. Every year you do two films and you change your position within the film. So in the first film, you're a sound man. The second film, you're a cameraman. The third one, you might be the script writer. The fourth one, the director, the producer. So basically, you play within all of this. And there was the introduction at that time. There was the 16 millimeter camera was hot. Like it's the same thing like when the 5D came out. Uh, I was like, yeah, when, I, when we got the 5D, for example, in 2009, it was a complete uh, shift in the way we're thinking of making films. And I can imagine, because before that, like before the 2009, it was like big cameras, it was very expensive to, uh, to rent and you need uh, certain people to be running it. Uh, but with the 5D came, it was like suddenly affordable, $1,200, you get that camera and like, and you start making a very good quality film, like HD that goes, can compete on any big screen after that. Uh, of course, that, that changes. I'm, I'm, for me, I think maybe like the, the Arab Spring today is related to that technical invention somehow, uh, making uh, high quality images through anyone can, can do that. And this was the same moment in the 19, uh, let's say it started with 1959 with uh, two films mainly, which is uh, Shadows, by uh, Jean Kazavitz and uh, Breathless by Jean Luc Godard. With both films, they used the 16 millimeter camera. Both films, they went out of the studio and they were filming normal people walking in the street. And somehow, kind of, it was the moment in, in the Western world where, like, reclaiming the public spaces and seeing how that manifested itself in the, in the aesthetic of, uh, of filmmaking. And that's what they were learning, basically, in, uh, in, in, in London. 
they were learning how to use the 16 millimeter camera. This direct relation, you are holding it, it's very intimate, as the intimate, your topic, as the intimate of the camera, your topic should be as well uh, intimate to you. Um, Sulafa Jadalla was doing uh, more classical uh, uh, education in Cairo, which is, uh, which is more coming from um, the heritage of Egyptian production um, that started from the 20s. So more studio work, more like heavy. And, and, but, but the intervention she did that she was the first Arab woman who does uh, a camera work because the camera work before that it was the 35 millimeter uh, cameras, the big uh, tripods, a lot of lights. You, you are dealing all the time with m mechanics and technicians, which was not very suitable at, as they think at that time for a woman to be doing that. But she had uh, to make a fight and her graduation uh, task was to be the first AC of Wahid Saif, I can't remember his name, but he was the DP of uh, the film called Al Jabal, a famous Egyptian film at that time, uh, uh, which is like, yeah, we w we'll take you to the Jabal to, to make sure that you can uh, do that. And she, she graduated, but at that moment, uh, 1964, she graduated the first one. It was also the time where the Palestinian Student Union was created in, uh, or like they were starting to be active in uh, Cairo. And that union was actually the, let's say, the origin of what will become later uh, the militant uh, Fatah, or uh, the, even many people from the PLO, but I would think the Fatah was there. So some say is that Sulafa was uh, hanging out with Abu Jihad, Khalil Wazir, and he asked her to, uh, uh, to, to photograph the people, the fighters who were going to do operations in Sina because uh, it was still, there was clashes happening in the borders and there's, Abdel Nasser was still allowing the, the, the Palestinian Fida'is to go and do operations. So, so she would be filming them, photographing them. Then when the things happened in 66, I don't know why they started moving to Amman and uh, especially after 67 war, the defeat and Abdel Nasser closing all of, he doesn't want to make any, uh, and un, un, yani like unplanned move with the Israeli uh, forces that can uh, uh, strike another war. So he really controlled the Palestinian Fida'in and they decided mo mostly to move to, uh, to Amman at that moment. There were of course other uh, stations like in Syria and in, in Iraq, but uh, they did it to, uh, to Amman. And they asked Khadi Sulafa to go there. It was the moment as well where Hani graduated, Mustafa graduated, both of three of them young graduate filmmakers uh, thinking about so what we should be doing and how can we be part and supporting the Arab, uh, the Palestinian revolution. And that's when they st created this thing, the PFU, which started in, um, in a place called, uh, they called it Al-Madbakh, which is like an old house. Uh, Al-Madbakh means al -kitch uh, kitchen in, in English. <laughs> and uh, they, they, it was the whole place was called the kitchen. Uh, according because they were using the PFU, they were using the kitchen as a place to, uh, to develop the negatives. They need the water and they need to, uh, to close it. And it was, I don't know, I think Fidayin were not eating a lot, using the kitchen a lot, so they were <laughs> using it uh, instead. Uh, at the same time, it's like this, I can imagine, uh, as they were telling me, uh, they were making bombs like Fida'in will be making bombs and the clocks for the bombs. At the same time, the negatives will be developed and they were this whole coloration or like uh, intersection between militant and uh, film, like filmmaker or photographer. And one of the guys were remembering, his name is Adil, were seeing like, yeah, we were dealing with negative, like with our cameras as the fighter were dealing with their uh, Klashnikov. So that when they were going to do an operation, the, the, the Fida'i or the militant will take the Klashen, they will take the camera and they will all go together. So I think there was a, something uh, c connecting between all of them. And uh, their main job or their main thing at the beginning was to document. To document, the, and they say it specifically, to document the revolution in its way to, to victory. Which is a bit weird. I mean, it's kind of the first time that that happens at that moment. Because most of the other narrative, like struggle cinema that came out was after the victory. Most of it. I'm, I'm sure there are many films that I'm not aware of that was made while the revolution is happening. A revolution, for example, the Cuban revolution, Argenian revolution, or Vietnamese uh, or war, uh, Laos, or whatever. But uh, with this one, they were much, much very aware that we need to create um, like uh, documenting and presenting a new image of Palestinian was uh, one of the tasks 
that they were uh, trying to do. And uh, Elias Sambar, um, he's a, a historian and a writer and our uh, the Palestinian representative in UNESCO. He's not staying along anyway. But he, he put it in a, in a nice way and says, uh, 1948, I mean, uh, when I asked him about uh, what is this obsession of documenting everything or happening on the moment while like, it's better that we be fighting and then we celebrate our victory and we document that rather than uh, just documenting everything on the spot. And he was saying for 1948 for Palestinian, it's a moment where we disappeared. Dis like totally disappeared from uh, from the international community, from all of the record. There is no state anymore. And for someone who's disappeared, his weapon would be a camera. Uh, and that's that, that's exactly the sense of what is the Palestinian revolution. It's all about, uh, it, it was mainly about the representation and coming back visually. Uh, the sound of the clashing was not to kill someone, was to prove that you exist that you have a sound, you have an image. Of course, he put it in a different way after that, Elias, and says, but the dilemma uh, is that we came back to the picture, but with a covered face. So, and it's always this invisibility, visibility question is always uh, hunting the Palestinian people. And even from the, the beginning of the photography uh, where the missionaries and the churches were sending photographers to test uh, photography technique, but they were using that in the Holy Land, and they were filming, photographing the Holy Land without people, which after that uh, took by the Zionist movement and said, this is a Holy Land without people for Holy people without land. Yani, or, um, so, yeah, and they, they always have a problem uh, with being visible. Uh, yani, I think that's, uh, that's the whole question of the century. Um, so yeah, th there was much awareness of, uh, of that moment and, uh, and they were continuing to do that. Of course, many, many, many uh, of the aesthetics comes from, and recently uh, we found uh, a, a notebook, uh, like a, a, a dossier by, made by, Must by Haini Johariye, uh, and it's basically the dossier that he's um, teaching other militants, because uh, there were three, three guys and they didn't have anyone working with them. So what they were doing, they needed to teach other, other militants. And I remember uh, Ammar, Ammar Abu Ali, who's the son of Mustafa Abu Ali, he was when in Beirut, maybe 77 or 78, he was young, he was like 10 years old, but he remembers when he goes to the restroom of the photographers, it's like uh, most of them, one without an eye, there's missing leg, missing hand. So basically there were militants who were getting injured in, uh, in operation, and so they were telling them, uh, one will go to radios, one will go to photography, one will go to uh, like writing or a factory or something. So you can see that there was a, a, a direct need to educate uh, these militants on how they would present their image. And uh, there is a lot of discussions in, in that notebook about like, uh, if you have like 10 minute reel, because in, before in 16 millimeter, you would have a 10 minute reel, that's the, the limit that you have. And you only have that 10 minute lear, lear, uh, reel. And there is like a question, what, do, would you, what would you do with that? If you're in the middle of a battle, how can you document, what are you gonna be filming to make sure that the message is gonna be out? I'm, I'm, I would be fantasizing or thinking about the answers. It would be really beautiful. Like maybe someone will be uh, filming uh, at the sunset and having maybe the, with this 10 minute reel. Uh, and this is, this is it, Yeah, it's all about the editing after that. Um, so yeah, um, maybe we'll see something else. They, 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 they didn't start at the beginning making films. It wasn't the idea of making films as much as it was documenting uh, the events. Like the events were, for example, the, the biggest event they, they documented and launched their uh, career, let's say, or this whole thing of militant Palestinian, militant cinema, and got the attention of the international filmmakers to come and get communicated with the uh, Palestinians, and especially with Mustafa and Hani and Sulafa, was the Karami battle, which was uh, 68, small group of Palestinians decided to stay and they all get killed, like most of them, but they had a symbolic meaning for the Arab world that uh, after the defeat of 67, four, four Arab armies were defeated uh, and suddenly there's a group of guerrilla fighters who are able to stand and they managed to damage like four or five tanks and they killed some Israeli soldier. But the thing is, they were waiting for such a moment. 
the minute the next day there was a directly uh, a press conference. You have uh, Salah Tamari, one of the fighters, speaking about he was the political commissaire at that moment and speaking to maybe like 20 cameras at that time. There was Mustafa Abu Ali and Hani and Sulafa filming different tanks and there is like the international media wanted to know about what is happening. So they started to organize. Before that was just like, yeah, we, 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 they were stealing cameras. They didn't have even cameras. They only had their own personal photography camera and they didn't have a film camera. The PLO, uh, the leadership, was not really understanding what, what does it mean to make films in, into the revolution or to document the, the events. But after the, May 60, after the 68 uh, event in March, uh, 68, they, uh, they suddenly realized that it's very important because one, one, one imagination, one, one interview I did was with a guy called uh, Jean-Pierre Olivier de Sardin. He's a visual anthropologist and he lives in Niger now. But uh, in, in May 68, for example, he was in Paris and he was part of this group called uh, Gouche Pluritarian, uh, the left pluritarians or something, which is somehow uh, taking the, the heritage of the Communist Party but taking it more in a fresh way. So they were organizing the people in the street. But for them, the main question was Palestine, and they got introduced to that uh, through uh, Hamshari, uh, Mahmoud Hamshari, and Azuddin Qalaq. And so they, 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 when he, he was telling me that when they decided, okay, May 68 happened, they needed to make a film about Palestinian revolution, and there was nothing about that. Uh, Mahmoud Hamshari brought him maybe 20 photographs made by Hani Johariya, and he gave it to him, and they made the whole film in Paris. So they put, put the pictures on the wall, and they were just like scr scrolling and moving uh, through them. Of course, the film is, I mean, we tried to look for the film together. He doesn't know, because it's only screened for several times in, until 70, and then he got disappointed with this whole uh, revolutionary movement and went to Niger and uh, was teaching more. Uh, and he didn't do any other films. So the film basically got lost, but it's very interesting. That was kind of like, okay, we start with photography before we do any negatives or like films. And it was the same thing with the Palestinian militant group, like the PFU. They started with photography, but they didn't thought about making editing until that uh, Roger plan comes. Uh, the Roger suggestions after 67 war, there was many talks between the Arabs and the Israelis to get a peace settlement. And Roger's, uh, Walter Rogers, I think his name is, who was the... Uh, Secretary of State the, of, of U.S. and he pr proposed this plan. And the plan was making a settlement between the Israelis and the Arabs without mentioning the Palestinian people in it. So again, there is like, oh, we are still invisible. We need to have a more fight to be uh, presented and people need to talk, like the international community need to talk to the PLO directly uh, rather than talking to the Arab uh, movement around them. And then that start, they ask the, P, uh, the PFU to make a film. I don't know if they ask them or the PFU themselves, they just documented the demonstration that happened in Amman in Beirut, and they made a film uh, about it called No For Peace Process, Lal Hal Silmi. The film is, uh, is totally lost also, again. There's the early period of, of uh, the militant cinema, it's very hard to find any of that films. Like the films later on made in 70s, late 70s in Beirut, you can find a lot of copies. But that's why, again, why I felt that it's very important to think about or to look at that period in, in, in Amman rather than in Beirut, because Beirut there was like an establishment thing, uh, I mean an established uh, institution, but in Amman there was like, yeah, a young group of young people who were just like hearing about Mao and the power of people and like there was some Maoists coming, uh, studied in China and came back and some uh, people coming from London and studying in France or they didn't really know what does it mean, what is the type of struggle we want to do, but the, what they know exactly that they had uh, they had the people uh, in the refugee camps, which is where they, they all the time trying to engage them. They didn't need really the image to be engaged, but it was very good to see. Um, they once, uh, Khadija and uh, Mustafa, they were th remembering the moment when they screened the, the do not, uh, no for peace process in Amman. And it was a moment where suddenly in refugee camps, I don't know if you know that, in refugee camps the honor was organizing every Thursday uh, a screening of Egyptian film. Uh, on one of the walls of the of the camp, and mainly it was the school of the camp. Um, and the Egyptian films of that time were kind of, um, you know, it, it has a, it had everything that the Palestinian miss. 
It had like the beautiful house, there is a car, there is big dinner parties, uh, the musical. So for them, for kind of the Palestinian refugees in, in Amman and being the honor world, cinema became the place where the dream happens and somehow. And suddenly yeah, they're seeing themselves being replaced. Uh, like replaced for each OE with a Palestinian militant or Fatin Hamame with a, uh, a, a militant female cleaning a gun. Uh, so they, and somehow they, they replaced the idols in the Palestinian mentality. And that's what, uh, I don't know if somebody saw, some, some of you saw the film yesterday when Abu Ammar, I mean, this is the honest thing maybe. We, we, we managed to change the Palestinian from refugees into a freedom fighter. And it's, again, I would add to that, we managed to change the image of the Palestinian from refugees to an image of freedom fighter. And there, there is also uh, the downside and the dark side of, of, of just build, building that on an image. And that's what we see uh, after that, because I don't think there was a real, um, let's say, real work on the ground. There was always a lot of corruption and there is a, lot, a big fight for power and representation within the PLO happening. And these poor guys of the PFU were just uh, taken within this uh, big struggle of representation. Um, I want to show you um, a scene from With Soul With Blood, which is the second film made by uh, the PFU. Of course, the first one was lost, and then they made With Soul With Blood, which was basically edited from the material they filmed while uh, happening, uh, the happening of 1970 September, Black September events. And Mustafa and, and Hani, Sulafa was not with them anymore because uh, she got shot while in a friendly fire while she was giving a workshop. One of the workshops they were giving to the militants uh, at that time, and one of them was playing with a gun, and she got shot in the head. So she was already out uh, when the Black September events happened. And then it was Mustafa Hani and like another two, three people with them, uh, Omar Mukhtar, Muti Ibrahim, and um, Adil. Uh, they filmed and they documented this, this the events happening, and they took it uh, with them out when they went to Beirut. Uh, the interesting thing about watching with soul, with blood, that you see that there is no one behind what is going to be said. So it's totally them, uh, the, the political message. And it seems like they were like, yeah, we have a lot of material. We need to add everything. So in somehow you can see that they're using text and the same time music and the same time using graphics, uh, fiction scenes, using um, uh, documentary scenes, uh, acted like uh, the beginning of the film as well with like kids playing on the, t uh, on the roof of um, a building. It's all come together in a making a very unique uh, style of film, a, a style that we, and somehow we can trace in the next two or three movies, at least the period when, till 74, we can, st we can still uh, taste or uh, follow this experimentation in the image they were doing. <laughs> على من فيها وأنه لا يمانع في قتل عشرين إلى ثلاثين ألفا في سبيل القضاء على العمل الفدائي وها هو ينفذ خطته المسلمة الحكومة الأمريكية الاستعمارية القذرة أشارت إلى أنها قد تتدخل لإنقاذ عرش الملك حسين إذا استعف موقفه فما هو موقف الملوك والرؤساء العرب في اتجاه قيام الملك الخميل لماذا لا ينتصر المجتمعون في القاهرة إلى عمان أو السرقاء ليشاهدوا بأعينهم وحشية المذبحة ويلمسوا بأنفسهم صمود شعبنا البطل ضد الطغيان الفاشستي العميل في الأردن
انما نحن قادرون لاجل هذا الانسان هذا الانسان الذي يراد له بما يسمى بالحروب السلميه الزائده هذا الانسان المطلوب منه بعد ان تشرد اكثر من 20 عاما ان يبقى بملوكيته وبمدفعه ليحمل وجود الله لي وكانه مخلوق في هذا العصر من المضطهدين والمظلومين ان يحموا الكيان الصهيوني ويجعل الصهاينه يعيشون في ارضنا بسبب امن وسلام. اسد كل شيء العقل الالكتروني قال لهم في ثلاث ساعات والعقل الالكتروني قال لهم الجيوب بنخلصها في ثلاث ايام ولكن العقل الالكتروني لا يستطيع ان يحسب اراده الشعب واراده الامه كورس ذس فيلم از از بريفنتد فروم بين سكرين ان بيروت ان ان عمان اي مين بيكوز اتس very much criticizing the Jordanian regime. And actually Mustafa Abu Ali had a lot of problems to come back after the 82 to go back, live back again in Amman. And when they had, he had finally the chance to make a meeting with the Jordanian intelligence. Uh, he told them like, uh, many, many people who were involved in the Black September, I didn't carry a gun even. So why are you making a lot of problems for me? And they said, who shot on us, we shot on him. But you did a film that we can't answer on it till now. So that's why he, even in Amman period, he was really restricted of traveling. He couldn't go anywhere. Uh, he couldn't do anything. And when he went to Ramallah, I think that was his depression. And in Ramallah as well, because we want to keep good relation with the Jordanian regime, uh, we can't screen this film. That's why it's good to be in a free place like here. <laughs> uh, it's a beautiful film, but it's very like thinking about the translation of the film. It's very hard because as you see, there is the voiceover and there is the text all the time happening. Here is like, he used some graphics of uh, Nazir Naba'a, who was uh, an artist of that time. Uh, <laughs> يا جبعا أخضر يا مصلوبا يخشاه القاتل حتى الموت أعرف أن لن تمتد يد النحوة إلا حتى تكسر يا أردن yeah. So this, this, this film uh, it was finished in 1971 and they screened it the first time in 1972 at the uh, Damascus uh, Film Festival uh, for, for youth film, film, filmmakers. And it, I think it got the silver award of that festival. And there was a lot of discussions and a lot of new avant-garde movement or images of films coming at that time. Especially I can remember a film called 100 Faces of a Single Day by a director called Christian Ghazi who died, who left us last year. Uh, and it's like, it's also this avant-garde, Godarian, uh, playing with sound, playing with image. There was no one uh, focus on, uh, like, uh, there, you feel that there is no institution behind it that is trying to, to speak something. But that created also a lot of problems because now Mustafa is alone in, in Beirut and he has, uh, he was like in front of the PLO and the leadership, he has to build up an institution, a cinema institution. Um, and with this film, and he wanted to keep working on this style, he couldn't. Uh, there was a big pro one, 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 I think, an incident, not many people remember it uh, with this history. It's, uh, Mustafa wanted to make a fiction film because he was trained as a fiction filmmaker, but he decided, okay, I'm going to serve the revolution now. We'll do a documentary for them. But in 71, 72, he already started working on a fiction film. Uh, it's called uh, by a filmmaker, by a writer, Rashad Abu Shawar. And it's called Ayam al-Hub wal-Maut, the days of love and death. Uh, 
that's the novel that he decided to make as a as a as a as a film, a feature film. But Rashad Abu Shawar was very critical of the PLO, and they he 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 accused them of being the reason on Fatah especially of being the reason of our defeat of the defeat of the Palestinian in in uh, in Amman and all of the consequences that happened after. So PLO suddenly decided we're not gonna fund you, Mustafa Abu Ali, to make that film, and he was uh, very angry of that. Um, so he made the film. It's called Zionist Aggression, uh, which is which is like I, if, if, I don't know if how many of you knows uh, they do not exist. A film by Mustafa Abu Ali that was made in '74. He made a film before that in '73 called Zionist Aggression, where it's kind of a purer cut of they do not exist. You can see the same style and the same uh, movement in the camera and using the the silence of the film. But I, I, from, from my understanding or from my kind of research, I felt that Mustafa was doing this, like making the silence. And this one is 20 minutes. You have 16 minutes of it is silence of Zionist aggression. And, and somehow he doesn't want, he wants to silence the propaganda of the institution uh, using an artistic form saying that ah, it's better that you look at the image without hearing a sound, which was also a discussion of that time. But for, for, for me, I think it's also that he doesn't want to hear the political leadership uh, speaking. He wants to silence them in their own funded movies.
Comparing that to the Palestinian films today, which Palestinian films were uh, today, after Ost especially, they are starting, the starting point is a checkpoint and the closing point is a checkpoint. So this, this is more, uh, for me, it's more like a seeing a future and uh, at least a hope all the time. But if I want just to go very fast to see, uh, where is, they do not exist here. This is the, with the last minute, of course, the, the one that everybody is like saying it's lost. Uh, again, we see here the same thing. The beginning, opening, nice people, nice life. It's very quiet. Music, it uh, reflects a kind of a relaxing and intimacy. Then we have the attack. Of course, it's better in terms of form and structure. They do not exist because he's using like uh, different types of music as well. And there is a, a drama element in it where a little girl is trying to is sending a gift for a militant fighter to show the community support. <coughs> but let's see maybe the last minute. Ah, Abu Abad is Zakar Adi, Aida. And this is the thing, like when uh, I've been working on this one, like in, in especially in European uh, film markets, it's like, so are you going to talk about the propaganda? I'm like, uh, what propaganda? I didn't see any propaganda in their movies. Like, are you talking about the Palestinian American cinema? But it's not about, for me, it's not about the <laughs> propaganda as much as the representation of how can you tell your, your story using what is available in front of you and uh, facing the obstacles in both, in uh, that we are suddenly speaking about ourselves and we, are, we don't have equipments to, to do that. So which create a very interesting format. Now, all of this, this, this fight, uh, I mean, this, this thing uh, with these films and the, the work that Mustafa Hani Sulafa were been doing, of course, it was almost ended with Hani uh, being killed in, uh, in the Civil War events in 1976, and Hani as well was part involved in making this 50, uh, 30,000 meters of negatives, and that's where we come back to the beginning of this uh, talk about uh, what did make, what was their uh, experience to go and do such uh, developing these movies. Um, of course, with the end in 82, this whole thing was disappeared and it was very hard uh, to take out the negatives from Beirut, the, the, at least the original uh, format of these films. But uh, luckily, I mean, they were uh, and somehow knowing that they were doing something for uh, the future and they were making uh, 60, 70 copies of each film and sending them all around the world, like for student unions in Chicago or in, like worker unions in, uh, in France and fighters in Mozambique. So we can now and somehow find many of these copies and uh, tell, tells us a lot about the uh, international connections with this uh, film. Now, um, I think I'm gonna end here and I prefer to go for a discussion. Uh, I didn't go into the international uh, connections with like different film groups that are working with them and to see uh, how these images were transferring in several films. Uh, it's, uh, but the only thing that changes uh, are the, is the sound. So the, like international filmmakers like Godard or Santiago Alvarez or other people would come, Van Kerken, they would be coming and taking uh, negatives and rushes from the PFU, copies of that, and then adding them to their films uh, with a different uh, soundtrack. So it's kind of, it's built on archive. There is a, an archival process that is happening all the time. And in the film uh, I'm doing, off frame, I'm also trying to take this technique and uh, add another sound layer to them. Uh, thanks a lot, <coughs> and uh, hope it wasn't too long or short. Well, thanks. <laughs>